you now have been on the radio for a while. It's 1967. It's the summer of love. And you're listening to Bob Dylan. You're listening to the Beatles. You're listening to Joan Baez. While you are have uh, access to this media and you're talking to the people of Southern California and relating to them through this music as well as the talk. Tell us about those days. Here are the bullet points. It was the mid 60s to the late 60s. They were the best years of my life. Uh, it was the best music, the best time. It was the age of innocence. Uh, I had a, a front row box seat to the culture heroes of my generation and generations to follow. I'm sure, Jim, this is something you can relate to because you've had, see, you, you're a season ticket holder. I was there for a very brief period of time. You still have your seat. So the idea during those years of being able to go to work, work, come on, to go to the radio station and interview uh, Mick Jagger or whoever it was, there were hundreds, there was, it was everybody, everybody, uh, to talk with them, to listen to their music, uh, to uh, finish the radio shows at one, two, three in the morning, go to Dupar's and Ventura Boulevard and uh, have a slice of that uh, apple pie with some vanilla ice cream, get home at around four o'clock in the morning, engage in leisure time activities, sleep till two in the afternoon, uh, put together guests for the next night. Come on, come on. Not bad, not really work. Shameful to cash the checks. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was, it was an education on air and the luxury of sharing it with so many people. Before we move out of that time period, and then I promise you we will, uh, uh, it, it uh, helped to shape, obviously, you. It changed the world. Now, I want to make sure that we understand each other. We haven't fixed it, but we as a generation changed it. Would you agree with that? Yes. No question about it. Yes. Okay. Um, give me the, the top three or four things that changed because of the confluence of the music, the political activism, and the media, meaning at that time would have been FM radio. What was the three or four most important things we did? Hmm. In no particular order, in response to your question. We hastened the end to the Vietnam War. 14 men of the 3rd Battalion, 60th NGIs, north of Saigon, were evacuating villagers. In the Mekong Delta, we laid the, the groundwork for black liberation through Malcolm X. We were brought here against our will. We were not brought here to be made citizens. We were not brought here to enjoy the uh, constitutional gifts that they speak so beautifully about today. The Martin Luther King. Deep down in our nonviolent creed is the conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old, as I happen to be, and some great truth stands before the door of his life, some great opportunity to stand up for that which is right. He's afraid his home will get bombed, or he's afraid that he will lose his job, or he's afraid that he will get shot or beat down by state troopers. He may go on and live until he's 80, but he's just as dead as 36, as he would be at 80, and the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died. Through demonstrations, through civil rights, we lead the groundwork for feminism, for taking women uh, from a place of subservience 
and allowing them the possibility of asserting themselves as individuals. We promoted and affected uh, Roe versus Wade, the legalization of abortion. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. We promoted the concept of free speech, that you could say what you want and express what you want artistically and verbally any way you wanted to do it. In other words, we honored the Constitution. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. We allowed people not to feel guilty about altering their own states of consciousness in the privacy of their own home and explore internal experiences. We spoke up. We became loud. We took to the streets. We asserted our own cultural independence. We loosened the boundaries of sexuality to suggest, perhaps for the first time in human history, well, contemporary history, that the expression of the sensual exchange may have had more to do with pro than procreation. We changed fashion. We changed music. The environment. We had a hell of a time. We did, didn't we? Yeah, we sure did. Now look at the grin on your face. I just want the camera to get the grin on Elliot's <laughs> face when he thinks about having a hell of a time. David Crosby said that we came along right in between the pill and AIDS. That was a hell of a time. Well, David Crosby knows a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff, and that's absolutely correct. Um, um, one more on this subject. You can I talk about sex for one more second? Certainly. Because David Crosby opened the... We're in a different time. And I did not mention in that litany of things that evolved in the 60s a subject called free love. Uh, and this is tender territory. I don't want to get Bill O'Reilly all, you know, worked up about this stuff. But the Woodstock generation, there are 40 million people who were my age who grew up in this period. It was after birth control. It was before HIV, which meant that there was license given to men and women to engage in sensual exchanges, but as a form of celebration of this holy interaction and interchange. And that was different than what came before. Now, be careful what you're doing now for all the obvious reasons, but you should have been there. 